15 items. First, this class is being live streamed um, to Facebook and also to YouTube. Um, you'll be able to see a recording of this class um, on those pages for a limited amount of time. We'll also be posting a link to the handout in the chat if you're on Zoom, and we'll pin the link to the top of the comment section on Facebook. If you have a question, please post that question into the chat if you're on Zoom or into the comment section on Facebook or the comment section of YouTube. Um, and we'll try to answer questions as they come in, but there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Um, we do ask that you will try to keep the questions pertinent to the topic of the class, um, as we're not going to have time to answer questions that do not pertain to the subject matter. We currently have a live transcript on Zoom. To stop seeing these subtitles, click on Live Transcript at the bottom of the screen and select Hide Subtitle. If you'd like to attend more of our webinars, you can learn more by searching Family Search Library webinars on Google or visit the Family Search Library Facebook page and check out the events there. And I'll turn the time over to Savannah. Thank you, Tanner. Um, so yeah, this class is uh, getting started with Swedish research and how to use Swedish church records. Um, the objectives of this class are to learn about the history of Sweden and a little bit about the records. Um, see examples of each record type that is typically used and walk through a case study. Um, my title alludes to church records because Sweden does have a state church, which means most of the records that you will be working with are church records. Um, so today I will be explaining the church record strategy to kind of help you um, learn more about the strategy that will be helpful. Um, so the history of uh, Sweden goes a little bit like this. Um, in 1686, the church records, there was a law that required church records to begin in 1686. Um, this doesn't mean that all records were started then. Some were ke kept at that point, but not preserved. Some priests didn't really start keeping them until a little bit later. And some were already keeping them at this point. Um, so that's just kind of a ballpark, but you can expect church records to begin around that time period, if not just a tiny bit later. Um, in the 1830s, there was a transition from a Gothic script, which is kind of the older German script that you probably heard about a little bit if you watched the German class just be before this one. Um, and it kind of transitioned into a Latin script, which is much easier to read. And that happened around the 1830s, which is important because immigration picks up in about 1840s. So if you have an immigrant ancestor from Sweden, um, they probably came to America or, or left Sweden around the 1840s. Um, and so most of the records are going to be in the Gothic script. In 1860, the parish record forms for all of the parishes across the country were standardized. So you start to see records that look very similar, no matter what part of the country you're in. Um, and then in 1865, this is an important date because they started what was called the record of missing persons. This was usually kept in the normal parish books. It was a list of people who the parish priest could not find. Um, it's important because the um, indexes that, the, that you can find for Swedish research tend to index these like they're normal people. So you might find your person on a list of missing persons and think that they reside in a certain area when maybe they don't. I see this happen a lot with people who are beginners. And so it's a good thing to be aware of. Um, and then in 1895, the church um, Husfaher, or the household record book, was replaced by what's called the First Shandlings book. This just took out most of the, the church reporting and just kept a record of the people more of their vital information and things like that um so the the record doesn't change a whole lot it just took out all of like the the church reporting um involved in the record um so let's kind of go into what the strategy for research during this time period looks like uh first we have what's called the household record we talked about it a little bit or alluded to it in the timeline um, but this is what i like to call a living census um, and it keeps a track of the family throughout time in a parish. Um, and that living census gives information about birth, marriage, death, moving. Um, so it is a good place to go to keep track of your family. And it will be the foundation for research in Sweden. 
Um, then it's supplemented with birth, marriage, moving, and death records. Um, so if you use that household record and then supplement it and confirm the dates with all of the rest of the records, you are able to create a very, very clear picture of what your family looks like, which is the beauty of Swedish research. Um, what this looks like in an actual strategy form is this. You, have, you start with known information. Typically, I like to start with somebody where I know their name, a date of one of their vital events, and a place that they lived. Um, as long as I know those three things, I can typically find them in Sweden. Um, so that's where you start. And once you have that information, you want to find a vital record. Um, the important reason you find a vital record is because that record will give you the name of the farm that they lived on. Um, and with the name of that farm, you're able to find a household record, um, which is that great key to finding all of the rest of the information. Um, household records are like censuses. So you want to find all of them for a person's life um, from the time they're born to the time that they die um, to get a good picture of where they were living, um, if they moved and all of that information. Um, so once I find one, I would just follow it for forward and backward in time until I've got all of the censuses or the household records for their life. Um, if the person moved, then um, I would look into if moving records were kept in the parish. Um, and then uh, I would verify all of the vital information that was given on the household records. So after I've got all the household records, I would verify all of the births and deaths and marriages that I see on those records. Um, to kind of round out the family and finish up the research. So I'm going to walk through each of these records and what you can expect to find and show you an example of what they look like. Um, so the clerical survey or the household examination record um, is that one like foundational piece. Um, they started in the late 1700s moving forward and kind of are have varied quality depending on the area, but they're typically very good. Um, they were used to track religious observance as well as family life events. Um, they typically contain birth, marriage, death, and moving information and often contain family relationships and added notes or like little tidbits about the family. Um, so if there was something going on or a piece of gossip, sometimes the priest would write that in. Um, and so that gives you a little bit more of the story and a clear picture of what, what's going on with the family for a certain amount of time. Um, this is typically what they look like. Um, they're a two-page spread. Um, the second page typically includes the notes as well as some information about their ecclesiastical um, standing with the church. So the first page looks like this, and I'll show you all of the important pieces. Um, first, here at the top, you've got the, you've got the farm name. Uh, most of these books are organized by the farm name, so you need to know where they lived in order to find them, um, or you need to be able to find them in an index. So um, that's a really key piece for finding them before the indexes are available. Um, and then you've got, before the person's name, there's typically a relation and an occupation, and then you've got the person's name. So here, just to, to show, this is the, real, the occupation right here, and then this is the person's name. And then down below, you've got the relation to the head of house listed by, by every person, and then you've got their name. Uh, after that, oh, um, I've got common abbreviations here. So the um, HU stands for history, you'll see that right here. Um, D stands for daughter, S for son, um, and then if you see a DR, that typically indicates Trink, which is an unmarried man, um, and then uh, P stands for Piga, which is an unmarried woman. Um, then if you see ENK, that usually stands for widower or widow. Um, so those are some good abbreviations to know. I also think I linked to a a Swedish word list in your handout. So if you have the handout, you can go to that Swedish word list and get a, a good um, indication of what those abbreviations are. Then the first call, like the first big set of columns here, it's the first three actually, gives you birth information. Um, this first column is the year, the second is the month and day, and the third is the place. 
Then you've got marriage information. So you've usually got the date here. And then if they are a widow or a widower, then you'll have the date of death for their spouse, um, the day they became a widow or widower. You've got their vaccination status. This is vaccination for smallpox. Um, and so if you see a V next to it, it just means they're vaccinated. Then you've got moving in information. So if they moved in from a different parish, then that information will show there. Um, and then the last column here is death date. Um, so this record is very rich uh, and gives you a lot of information about the family. Um, after that record, then we'll kind of move into vital records. Um, so you'll use that record as a foundation and then you'll want to prove everything by looking at the vital records and confirming the dates that are in the household record. Um, the first record you would look at is birth. Um, this typically includes the name, the date of the christening, the date of the birth, parents and witnesses. Um, sometimes it will also include um, the mother's introduction. This is when she would have been reintroduced into the church after the birth. Um, it's typically about six weeks after she gave birth, um, typically at the point where she stops bleeding and is starting to heal. Um, so this is, it typically will not give you much more than the household record, but it will confirm dates for you. Um, this is an example of what one looks like. Um, the important keywords here are food, which means born, um, deftus, which means christened, fereldrar, which means parents, and barn, which means child. Um, this is an, a more difficult one to read because it is in Gothic, but we'll kind of highlight the important parts so you can see where the information might, might sit. So here we've got the name of both of the parents. We've got Lars Lambertson and his wife, Katarina Andersdotter. Then we've got the place that they're living, which is Gamla Pershitan. You've got the birth date, which kind of can be in a couple different areas on the page. So here we've got the date, which is the third. We know that it's June because of the heading at the top and the year is 1770 because of the heading at the top. Um, then we've got the christening date here, which is the 4th of June. And you've got that keyword here that says dept to indicate that. We've got the name of the child and this black box over here indicates the witnesses. Um, so that's the information you can expect to find on these. Um, now we'll move into marriage records. Um, engagement and marriage records can include the name, occupation and social standing of a person as well as the marriage date and place and sometimes the engagement date um, depending on how the records were kept. Um, for a marriage to take place in Sweden, you would need bondsmen for the engagement to kind of assure that the marriage would happen. Um, and then you would typically get engaged and then you would have to announce bans three times in church uh, to make sure that there were no objections to the marriage. And so those would be announced and those dates might be recorded and then the marriage would, would occur. So if there are multiple dates, um, that kind of explains why, and we'll walk through one on a record. So here is, here is our record. Um, we've got the dates of the bands here on the side. Um, so the 12th and the 26th of March, and then the 2nd of April. Then we've got the date of the marriage, which is in the 15th of April in 1848. Then we've got the the two um, the two people involved. So there's Carl Johan Christofferson and Hannah Lars' daughter. Then we've got the places where they were living. So after Carl's name, it says that he was living at this farm, and after Hannah, <coughs> you've got her farm listed as well. And then here, this person is also keeping track of what number the marriage is. And in this case, it's the first marriage for both of them. And then you've got their ages, which can give you an approximate of when they were born, if you need it. Um, you've also got that farm name, so you could go back to the household record and see if that can give you birth information as well. Um, the last record that we're going to talk about in vital records is the death records. Um, death records can include name and occupation, family relationships, um, the date and place of death, the cause of death, and age at death. Um, 
We can also include how long they were sick. And um, if there's only one date, it will typically be the burial date and not the death date. Um, because the burial um, it for the church uh, was more important. Um, this can also have varying levels of detail depending on the person. I've seen some that are like whole obituaries and some that are very, very brief. So it kind of depends on the priest and where you're at and the person who's who has died. Um, but you can expect to at least find their name, a few relationships, and a date of death. So here's what a death record might look like. Um, some keywords are big grovning, which means burial. Uh, and you can see that right here. Dada, which means um, deceased or death. Um, and then you've got older, which is the age, and you can see that right here. And hukdom, which is the sickness. And you see that right here. So it starts at the top and wraps around to the second line here. So first we've got the death date, which is January 3rd. And then you've got the burial date, which is January 7th. So in this case, it keeps both and they're in nice little columns, so they're easy to see. Then you've got the primary person. And in this case, it's the widow, Ingra Sven's daughter. And you've got the place that she was living. Then you'll usually have her age. In this case, she was 61 day, years and 21 days. Um, and you've got the cause of death over here. Um, the, the word list linked in the handout actually has a very good list of the common causes of death. So if you look up something here, you see hosta, you're not quite sure, you can go to that word list and find more information about what these sicknesses are. Um, the last record we're going to talk about is the vital records, um, or like is the Swedish moving record. Um, this is one that is not as common. Um, they happen for a smaller time period, usually in about the 1820s. There was about a 10-year period where these were kept consistently. Um, but it really depends on parish. So I, I would always look at your parish and see when they were kept. So you're just kind of aware of what you're working with. Um, because they can be very useful and give you just a little bit more information to help you find a person that maybe is hard to find. Um, they can include the name and occupation, the date they moved, the parish or farm that they lived on, and the parish or farm that they moved to. Um, if it's a moving out record, it will typically typically give you the parish or farm they lived on and the parish they moved to. But if they're moving into a new place, it'll give you the parish they moved from and the farm they moved to, if that makes sense. So like, it will give you more detail about the parish that the record's actually being kept in. Um, so if you're looking for somebody who's moved, you'll want to look where they moved out as well as where they moved in, because both records will be important. Um, and yeah, these, like the availability of these is, is very varied. Um, so don't worry if you can't find it. You can usually work around having moving records, uh, but they are useful when you can find them. So it's always worth checking. This is what one looks like. Um, this page particularly has the moving in on one side and the moving out on the other. Some have them in completely separate parts of the book, but this is the format I see most often. So this is why I chose this example. So if we look in on the moving in side, um, here you'll get a couple different things. First, you'll get the number um, of like the person moving into the parish. So every year they start the number system over again. So this was the first person to move into the parish for the year. You've also got the date that they moved in. <clears throat> and then here we've also got a page number. Um, I believe that this is the page number to the household records. It will, it will vary depending on the book. Sometimes it's a page number to the household record or to the number of the certificate that they brought with them, depending on the time period. So keep note of that. And um, it would be good to double check in the household records if that does um, align with the page number. Then you've got um, the person listed. And in this case, we've got um, the widow Johanna Wiekman with children. Sometimes all the children will be listed out, but sometimes it just has one line saying this family moved in. And that's what it's happening here is it's saying Johanna Wiekman and her children moved in. 
Then on the side, we've got where she came from and where she's going to. So she came from the parish of Fern Fernabo and she went to the farm of Saxheathon. So if that page number didn't um, didn't pan out, then we could go to the farm of Saxheathon and look for her that way. Um, this is one more example of what it looks like. These are moving out records. Um, you see Utflitada here. So in means moving in and Ut means moving out. Um, so if you look at one of these, you've got the year, um, like the ORS number, the person moved in. He was the third family to move in or whatever. And then we've got the the date um, that they came in. Um, you've got the number in the household record book. And that says, like right here, it says that directly. So we know that that's exactly what that is. And we could go to the page in the household record book and find the family there. Then we've got um, this person listed. So it's an Anders Johansson. Um, and he's got his whole household. So it says mad household, which is with the household, um, which means he's got family coming with him. They came from Norbotan and they're going to, um, or sorry, I can't read right now. Um, they came from Norvestaby. Um, that's the farm that they came from and they're moving to Saltdalen. So you've got the, the farm that they're moving away from and the parish that they're moving to. And then you also have the size of the family on this one. So it says that there are two men and three women. So you can assume, and this would need to be confirmed with the household records, but you can assume that there is Anders and one son and then his wife and two daughters. Um, and then you can confirm that with the household records to make sure you've got the family right. So now that we've talked a little bit about all of the records, I want to show you how they all work together um, using a little bit of a case study. Um, the handout will go through more how to access the records and we can talk a little bit about that in the Q&A as well, but I wanted to make sure that you understood the strategy um, before sending you off on your own in the records. Um, so let's use Selma Berryman as our example today. So our known information, and this would be kind of what you pull off family search or what you find out from relatives. Uh, for her, we knew that she had a husband named Gustav Adrian Carlson. Um, she has two sons and a daughter, um, Laga Batil, Gustav Allen, and Gunhild Christina Francina. Um, we know that she was born on the 28th of March, 1896 in Nora Roda. Um, and then I also like to have a very clear goal. So in this one, it's verify Selma's vital dates, which is her birth, marriage, and death, and identify Selma's parents and siblings. So we're going to start with that known information. We know that she has um, a husband and three kids. We know when she was born and where. So that's where we want to start. So we have our known information, and we have enough to start and find a vital record. So we went and looked for her birth. We've got her exact birthday. So I pulled open the Nora Rota book and looked for her birth. And this is her entry right here. We've got her being born on the 28th of March in the right year. And it's a Selma and her parents are listed as Johann Henrik Berryman and Maria Jens' daughter. We've, we're also super lucky by because we get birth dates for them in this birth record, and we've got a page number to the household record book. So we do want to find a farm name here. So if we co go back to the record, we can actually look at that in the record. We've got a page number to the household record book, but if we want to know the farm name, it typically will be right after the, the name of the father. And in this case, it's Shans Fabrique. So we know that. Um, and then again, the page number in the household examination book will also help us. So it's Shans Fabrique, but it's on page 343. So we can go and open up the household record book next. And so that's what we'll do. We'll go to the household record book. We found Shans Fabrique at 343. And we found the whole family here, Selma, at the bottom. Um, and I've made a list here so that you can see it in the script as well as um, on the side. So we've got Johann Henrik Berryman with his wife, Maria Jan's daughter, and then all of their kids. Um, we've also got 
birth information in the second column for all of them, including Selma's birth date with, with 28th of March, 1896. So it's matching with the birth record and everything's looking great. The place is listed as Nora Rora, but we've also got the place of birth for her parents, which can help us to kind of move forward. Um, we've got the place um, that they're living, Sharon's Fabrique. And then another note here is that Maria Yen's daughter is crossed out. If we come to this column here, you'll see the marriage date. They were married in 81. But then this column where it says Ankling um, or widower, um, under Johan, it shows that um, he became a widower in 97. Uh, it doesn't actually give Maria's death date on this page, but it does give that date of when Johan Henrik became a widower. Um, which would indicate that we need to go look for a death on that day for Maria Young's daughter. Um, but before we do that, we're going to come back to our strategy just so that we can stay focused. And we want to find all of the household records for the family before we go off searching for other things. So that's what I did. Um, I followed the family forward in time and they ended up moving a little bit, but there were no moving records available. Um, but we did follow them forward in time. We've got Johann Henrik and his family going forward. Here's another one of those records. We've got um, we've got her living with her husband now and they've got Laga Bertil. And we, here's where the notes start to get interesting and start to tell us a little bit of the story that we didn't know before. Um, so this indicate this um, note on the side indicates that um, Laga Bertil, one of the sons that we knew that they had, was actually Gustav's, um, Selma's husband's first son um, and he was illegitimate. Then the note below says that Gunhild and Gustav Allen belonged to both of them. So it gives us a little bit more of the story, uh, as well as giving us some details that maybe we didn't have before about where these kids were born, um, so that we can go and find their birth records later. We've got Selma Berryman's birth date right here to confirm that we've got the right person still, and we can follow her through these records using that birth date as a confirmation each time. We've got her birthplace. We've got the marriage date. So now we have a marriage date for Selma and Gustav that we can look up her marriage with. Um, on the top of the page, it's not it's not shown in this image, but we can see that she was born in Jernwegen if you scroll up to the top of the page. Or not born in, but living in Jernwegen at the time. Um, and so this is all of the information that we can pull from this. We've got um, a little bit of a story of who's living in the family, uh, how they're all related, as well as the uh, vital information for the family. If we keep moving forward in time for Selma, um, we can get all the way to 1960. Um, and th that follows the whole family all the way through. After we do this, um, I just wanted to make another note of moving records. In this case, they were not helpful because the parish didn't have them. Uh, thankfully, we had great indexes to move from one parish to the next, uh, but there were no moving records, so we didn't end up needing them this time around. And you can just skip that, skip that step if you don't need it, and then verify vital information. So we've got all of these household records. We have so much data that we just found and compiled. And now it will be time to kind of sift through and verify all of the vital information that we've now found. Um, so for example, we saw that their marriage date was in 1919 on this household record. Um, and we also saw that their first daughter was Gunhild Christina Francina, and she was born in Hogfirsch. Um, using that information, um, we know that in 1919, we don't know where they were in 1919, but we do know that Gunhild Christina Francina was born in Hogfirsch in 1920. Um, so we can use those two clues um, to find out where they are. Hogfirsch is actually a farm in Ostrofogelvik. And so we were able to find a marriage record in Ostrofogelvik for this couple where we've got Gustav Adrian Carlson and Selma Berryman. 
We've got the dates of the bands on the side, the name of each person, the farms that they were living on, as well as a page number for the farm. Uh, we've also got on the next page over, we've got the date of their marriage, as well as other information. We've, we've got birth dates included, as well as um, the bondsman and the, the day they were engaged. Um, so we've got a lot of information that we're pulling from this marriage. And now we've confirmed that the marriage happened on the date that we thought. And now we know where. So we started with this known information for Selma. We knew some of the relationships. We knew that she was born in um, 1896 in Nora Rora, And we were able to kind of flesh that out and learn a little bit more. So now we've got a great timeline for her. We know that she was born on the 28th of March in Sharon's Fabrique, Nora Rota Parish. We know that she moved and was living in Udaholm from 1903 to 1911. We know that she moved again, and from 1911 to 1919, she was living in Lindos, Astrofogovic. We know that she married in Astrofogovic in 1919. And then we knew that she moved again and lived in Hogfirsch until 1958. And we know that she died in Hogfirsch um, on the 14th of August, 1958. We were also able to confirm her family, um, her father, her mother, a stepmother, along with several brothers and sisters and half brother and a half brother and a half sister and a stepsister. Um, so we were able to add all of these people to our family tree based on the, the, the cycle strategy for one person. Um, the next step would to be confirm to, to confirm the information about these people and start moving forward with the research for the next generation. So we did finish our cycle and verify all of the vital information for Selma, and now we can move on to the next. Um, that concludes what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, so we can open it up to questions. And I'm happy to answer any questions or demonstrate a few things if we've got the time. Um, so Tanner, what kind of questions do we have? Yeah. Um... Pam said, would you say more about the index? Um, where is it found? What info is on there? Um, what is it indexed by? Okay. So there are a couple different indexes that you can work with. Um, one of the ones that is honestly the best that you can get is on Archive Digital. Archive Digital is a subscription site that is available at, for free at our family search centers around the world. Um, so I can show you a little bit of what that looks like. Um, here is the Archive Digital website here. Uh, if you click on index search, household records are um, under an index source called the Population of Sweden, 1800 to 1947. So they cover a really great time period, especially for immigrants, um, where you'll get quite a few of these household records. You might be able to get one or two generations easily with this index before you have to go back into a time period that is not indexed. Um, the simple search will typically work um, with a name and a birth date. I typically like to use just the first name and then their exact birth date. So in this case, if I used the example of Selma, put in Selma 1896-0328, which is her birth date, year, month, day, back like put her birthday backwards year month day with no spaces or dashes or anything um, so if you do that and click search then it will search through all of the household records in the index and give you a list of um, all of the possibilities so these are not all her um, but if you see all of the ones with Berryman definitely are um, and you can start to go through them and confirm the relationships in this case, we've got Selma Berryman and Gustav Adrian Carlson uh, with their family. If you click on this, it will open the image for you so that you can see the image and easily access the information for this person. Um, family Search and My Heritage also have similar indexes, but they don't cover the same time span. I believe that Family Search and My Heritage both have an index that covers at least 1860 forward. 
Um, but I think it might be 1840 for my heritage. Um, so if you have either of those, um, if you've got my heritage or you want to use family search, those are also very helpful. Um, they just don't cover the same amount of time, which is why if you have access to Archive Digital at a center, then that is definitely the best one to go to. Awesome. Um, somebody asked how you knew that child was illegitimate. Oh, um, now that I'm looking at it closer, um, now that we're in the image, instead of me looking at the record, um, that is actually my fault. Um, the, I, it's abbreviations. So, um, this actually is an abbreviation for henna, which is her, um, and it's the, the first and last word with a, a colon in the middle. That's a common abbreviation you'll see in records sometimes. Henna means her, son, and then it also says F, which would indicate first, and then A with two dots is ectenscop. Um, I thought that was an O when I was looking at it in the slide. So I said illegitimate um, because I did not review my slides thoroughly and that's my fault. Um, but this is actually indicating that it's her son from a first marriage. Um, so um, me knowing that right off the bat or like seeing it and being able to say that just comes with time. Uh, but the keyword list that I linked in the handout also has a link to an abbreviations list. It, you can find it on the Family Search Wiki. Um, if you click on Search and then Research Wiki and go to Sweden, type just type Sweden in the search bar and click on Sweden Genealogy. It will take you to a wiki page um, where we have a word list. Um, this word list does include abbreviations, but there's also a link to an abbreviations word list where if you're seeing abbreviations like that, you can come here and look to see what common abbreviations are. So in this case, we had an A with two dots, which is at the end of the alphabet. Um, and so you can see what it's typically used for. Um, and kind of piece it together with the information you have. Uh, sometimes it's kind of a guess. Um, I mean, we all personally abbreviate a little bit differently in our lives, and these priests are the same. So they're just going to do what's best for them. And it's typically because they see this as something that they'll reference, but nobody else will. Um, so you have to be a little creative with this. In this case, the A with two dots in, in our list doesn't say Scott, but if you see this AKT, that does. Um, and so you have to kind of just work with what you've got um, and, and use the resources available. So these word lists will help you quite a bit when it comes to finding out information like that. Okay. Um, somebody just asked for the handout again. So there's that. Um, so, like, um, so would people typically change their name when they immigrated from like Svensson to Dahlgren? Um, yeah. <laughs> so there are a lot of reasons a person in Sweden can change their name. There was actually no regulation on naming in Sweden. So you could change your name at any point. Um, it typically, the most common times it happens is when somebody immigrates. Um, they don't want to be the old, like the millionth Andrew Johnson in the Swedish area they moved to. Um, so they'll maybe change their name so that they have a little bit more unique identifier. Um, in Sweden, sometimes when they like become a master of a trade, they'll change their name to what I like to call a two-part nature name, which would be something like Dahlgren. Um, and they're typically two syllable names. Um, they tend to flow a little bit better if they have like a one syllable or a shorter name, um, then typically that indicates military, um, with the military, you were often assigned a name that was short, easy to call out, um, and helped to identify different people so that there weren't like three cadet Johnsons. Um, so it just kind of helps with 
uh, identifying people. You'll see people do that a lot um, just as a way to identify themselves and make themselves um, easier to find in a crowd, I guess. Um, and there were no regulations with it. So somebody could have their patronymic name that they were born with, as well as like maybe two or three other names throughout their life. Um, and you just kind of have to roll with it. Um, there is a class in the Family Search Learning Center that goes more in depth on Swedish naming practices. Um, I can try to find it and put a link in the chat. Do you have any other questions while I'm doing that? Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. So what is what are the best repositories to find Swedish church records? So I would say the first one, again, would be um, Archive Digital. It's definitely the easiest to use, especially for an English speaker. Um, I did just post the, the class on naming practices in the chat for anybody who would like that. Um, but yeah, Archive Digital is the best um, and the easiest to use for an English speaker. Um, and it's because as long as you know the parish, you can find the place and see the collection really easily. So for example, Nora is where most of my family's from. If you type in the name, if you click on archive search, type in the name, you can find it easily and see all of the collections for that place all in one, one place, easy to see, English translation, really nice. If you're looking for something that you can access from home for free, um, I would say the best place is the National Archive of Sweden. Um, it's, the URL is reeksarchivet.se. Um, I think I've also linked this in the handout, um, but I can kind of walk through just a little bit how to use the site. Once you're here, um, up in the top corner, there is an option to change language to English. This will only get you so far, but it will help you get started. Um, once you're on this page, don't click on genealogy, click on search the collection. And it will take you to this page where you want to click on digital research room. Once you're here, like three clicks in, um, now you can type in um, the name of the parish that you would like to search. You can also narrow it down by county and archival type. So here you can click on church records. I would suggest you do that, especially if your parish is a very common name. Um, And then once you search it, you can find the, the correct um, parish in your list. So Nora Berry for Schelming is where my family's from. It's the example I always use. Um, and then here you've got the same list that's in Archive Digital. It's just not in English anymore. Um, you could use Google Translate at this point to translate it a little bit, but it's not going to be a perfect translation and it's a little bit harder to navigate. Um, they do have letter codes, so household records are always A, births are, are C, um, marriages are E, and deaths are F. Uh, and that is going to be the same in Archive Digital, too. If you look here, you'll see the same pattern where household records are A, and then down, going down, there's a letter code for each. Um, but once you're here, if you want to look at birth records, for example, and open up a collection here. Um, you'll choose the years that you want to open and then you'll click on the green button that says build. I, when I'm doing research, uh, there are times where I will come here instead of archive digital. And the reason is because um, a lot of the times it's indexed by year. So if you use this um, like sidebar and click on Nora and then just kind of click open, um, the next is Fedosea Dope, which is the births and baptisms, and then you've got a list of years. So if you know that your person was born in 1833, for example, you can click right to 1833, and you don't have to do the sifting that you would have to do on Archive Digital to find the right year. Um, and then you can kind of go through page by page. Um, the images are black and white, they're scans. Um, so they're not quite as nice as you will often see on Archive Digital, but it's a perfectly 
a perfectly good and usable resource that is available completely for free. Um, so Reeks Archive is an uh, amazing website and it would be great to get familiar with it if you're going to be in Sweden. Awesome. There's time for one more question. Um, okay. How do you find late household exams, like recent ones? Recent ones? So the, the collection for Archive Digital goes all the way up until household exams stopped. Um, or until like the household record stopped, I would definitely go with Archive Digital if you're looking for late, just because it's going to be the easiest to use. Um, after 1847, if you're looking later than that, Archive Digital also has censuses in 40, 50, all the way to 90. So you can get censuses for people in Sweden all the way up to 1990. Not all of them will allow you to see the image, but you'll at least get an index. Um, that can help you to trace the family during that time period. They usually happened every five years um, and will kind of help you follow the family going forward. Um, but yeah, the best place to go is Archive Digital just because it will allow you to see all the way up to that far without changing your strategy at all. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I know we didn't have time to get to all the questions, but um, we're glad you're here. Our next class will be um, getting started with Irish research. And that'll be in 15 minutes. And uh, we hope to see you there.